In the last few lectures, we have been taking a look at circuits using op amps, and we have already seen several wonderful circuits you could design very, very simply using the wonderful properties that op amps have. In this lecture, we are going to take a look at a few more advanced applications. There are plenty of advanced applications using op amps, and so we are going to only scratch the surface and give you an indicator of a few such applications. Whole books have been written on op amp applications, and it would have taken me the whole semester just to describe a fraction of them. So we will not try to be comprehensive, but some of the more important applications are the ones we are going to discuss in today's lecture. So let's start. And we will begin with something which we have already seen in the last lecture. This is a differential amplifier. I'm not really quoting this as an advanced application. We have already talked about this in the last video and it was a pretty simple, straightforward one. But we will point out that you could generalize the circuit there. But more importantly, the circuit as it stands has some shortcomings and you can improve upon that and build a much, much better amplifier whose output is proportional to the difference of the two inputs by using this as one part of the circuit. So first let's understand the general differential amplifier which is this one. We have, we have already met this circuit before. The only difference in this case is that instead of using four equal resistors as we did in the last video, we are allowing the resistors to be different. And you might be wondering why are we calling the resistors R2 and R3 and not R1 and R2. Well, that's because this is only part of a circuit, the final part of a circuit, the instrumentation amplifier, which is our real topic. And that has the resistance R1 in it. And also, of course, you could easily understand that we could generalize this further by using four different resistors. And it's pretty easy to calculate what the output is going to be for that case. However, for our present purpose, two equal pairs of resistors, two R2s and two R3s, are what we need. And in this case, uh, essentially because I've copied this diagram from the net somewhere, this is more detailed than the ones I've usually drawn. It actually shows both the power supplies which are to be connected to the op amp. You must realize that although I have not been drawing power supplies to my op-amp circuits, all op-amps need power supplies to work. Without the power supplies, the op-amp simply will not work. So even if I don't draw them in, they are always assumed to be there. Okay, so let us quickly analyze this particular circuit and it's pretty straightforward. You just start from the fact that you have two, you have two voltages V plus and V minus, which are our inputs applied to the circuit and if this is V plus, the voltage here is going to be simply something you can find out using a series potential division formula. Once again, R2 and R3 are not really in series. However, nearly the same current flows through them because very, very little current is actually going to flow into the op amp and therefore we can forget about this term. So whatever current flows here, is the same as the current which flows here and as a result we can simply figure out that the voltage here is going to be R3 by R3 plus R2V plus and that is going to be the same as the voltage here assuming of course that our circuits are working in the linear region. So this is the virtual ground principle at work and now we know that the voltage here is given by this. Fine. So. Let's get to the next stage of the analysis and that is where we start with these values and then use the fact that the voltage here is R3 by R3 plus R2 into V plus to figure out how much current there will be here which is simply the voltage difference across resistance R2 V minus minus this R3 by R3 plus R2 V plus times 1 by R2 Ohm's law. As I said, in most op-amp applications, all you really have to do is 
use the virtual ground principle as long as the op amp is in the linear region and then apply Ohm's law. So this is the current flowing here. The same current, remember, is going to flow through R3. So voltage difference between two ends of R3 is simply R3 times this current. So that's the voltage difference. And that subtracted from the voltage here will give you the output voltage, which is this one. And it will take a bit of simple algebra to figure out that this is going to be R3 by R2 into V plus minus V minus. So this is a differential amplifier. Its output is proportional to the input V plus minus V minus. And just to sort of recall what we did in the last video, there we had four resistors all equal, therefore RC was equal to R2 in that video, and therefore we just had V plus minus V minus the difference. Here you have a difference times a possible scale factor. And the good thing is that the scale factor can be more than one, it can also be less than one. Let me just remind you once again that a major application of op amps is to do calculations. And when you are calculating, it's not necessarily a larger output that you want. You may want 0.5 times the difference and it's perfectly possible to achieve that using this particular circuit. Okay, so this is the differential amplifier, our old acquaintance. We have already met that in the last video. But let us now try to see how we could use this circuit to actually design a much, much better version of a differential amplifier called the instrumentation amplifier. But before we do that, let's just try to understand why this is not such a great circuit. After all, why improve this if this is already were perfect? It is producing an output which is proportional to V plus minus V minus. And that is fine. The only problem here is that notice that the current drawn by this circuit from both the two inputs is not negligible. Here, you have a current given by this. Well, basically V plus is being dropped across R2 plus R3. So unless you use very large resistances, the, the current flowing in is going to be rather substantial. Same here, unless R2 is huge, this current is going to be rather substantial. Now you might say, what's wrong with using a very, very large resistance? Why don't we just place, make R2 and R3 mega ohm order, or even several mega ohms order, and then say, that's all we need to have a very high impedance on both sides, and hence draw a very little current. Now the problem with that would be, once these resistors become too huge, then the approximations we have used, the fact that no current is drawn by the op-amp, after all, is an approximation. Very, very little current is drawn by the op-amp. And in typical resistance scenarios where R2, R3 are of kilo ohm order, and hence these currents are typically milli ohm order, neglecting this few hundred nano amperes at most current which flows into the op-amp is perfectly good. However, if we use few mega ohms for R2 and R3, so the actual currents in the circuit drop down quite a lot, becomes a fraction of a microampere, and then you can no longer ignore the few nanoamperes. Say 100 nanoamperes is really 0 0.1 microampere, so it's no longer negligibly small. So our circuit analysis goes wrong or becomes rather badly approximate, and hence the output doesn't come out as neatly as this. And we really, for mathematical calculations, we really need this formula to be very accurate. Now you might also ask, what's wrong with uh, the circuit drawing in current? But remember, you've already seen this before. You're going to connect sources, real sources, to this differential amplifier in order to get the output which is proportional to the difference of the voltages. And if your circuit draws a substantial amount of current from the sources, the internal impedance of the sources is going to cause a large drop across the source. As a result, what is going to happen is that the output that you are going to get is not going to be proportional to V plus minus V minus or it is going to be proportional to V plus minus V minus. It's just not going to be proportional to the difference between the voltages that you apply because the source voltages that you are trying to apply are not what the circuit is getting. 
That's the same problem that you have with low input impedance circuits which try to sample voltage. Of course, the problem could be at the output stage as well. That is, you have to connect a load here and if you have a very small load, you will be drawing in a lot of current and then the op amp's own output impedance is going to come into play. However, the op amp is sufficiently small output impedance and negative feedback makes it even smaller in effect. So, you don't really have much to worry about on that score. But the input impedance of the circuit, which is not the input impedance of the op amp, remember the op amp takes in very little current, the current flowing in here are tiny as we have said. But the current flowing in here and here are not negligible at all. We have already calculated that they are pretty large. And that is where the problem comes in. So, a good amplifier should be able to isolate the sources from itself. That is, it should not really be drawing a lot of current from the sources. And it would also help if you had a way of say tuning the gain rather easily. You might say it's easy to tune the gain. Just, just change R3 or R2. But remember, here the two R3s have to be identical and two R2s have to be identical. So if you want the formula to hold you and you change the R3, you have to change both R3s identically. Now doing that smoothly in a circuit by say turning a potentiometer knob would be rather difficult to accomplish. So, this circuit, though it's pretty good for a first attempt, has really some severe problems. So, how do we improve upon that? The answer is we go in for what is called an instrumentation amplifier. So, now let us take a look at the instrumentation amplifier, which actually builds upon the differential amplifier that we have been speaking about and improves upon it. So, the circuit for the instrumentation amplifier goes this way. As you may have noticed, and let me just try to highlight this for you. This part of the instrumentation amplifier circuit is exactly the differential amplifier that we have been dealing with so far. What this circuit has are two extra amplifiers. And one very important point that you must note is that for both the amplifiers, which have inputs V1 and V2, the inputs are actually being fed directly into the non-inverting input of the op amp. Notice that here the labeling of the inputs is essential because we are deviating, at least for the top one we are, of the convention that if unmarked, the upper terminal, upper input terminal is going to be the inverting one. Here, for this op amp at least, the upper in terminal in the drawing is the non-inverting one. Now, one important point here is that the, the sources V1 and V2, this is where you are actually going to connect your signals, they feed directly into the op amp and hence very, very tiny amount of current is drawn from them. There is no other pathway for the circuit to draw extra current. So, this solves the problem that we had earlier of having a huge, uh, this one has a huge input impedance for both V1 and V2. So, you don't have to worry about the fact that your circuit may draw a huge amount of current from the sources. Now, after that, you have this raised R1, which remember is the reason why you had to call these R2 and R3 in the first place to match resistors R1 and the resistor Rg here. Now, let's see how that helps and especially how that helps in giving us the ability to control the output or the gain factor of the output smoothly. So, let's go on and try to analyze this circuit. Again, analyzing an op-amp circuit is really very simple. Especially a linear op-amp circuit, all you have to do is assume virtual ground and take it from there. So, assuming all three op-amps are working in the linear region, if this voltage is V1, so is this one. If this is V2, so is this one. This is the virtual ground principle at work. Remember the difference between the two inputs have to be tiny. 
So V2 here to the non-inverting input means V2 to the at the inverting input as well. Of course, that means that these two voltages, the two ends of Rg are V1 and V2. So V1 minus V2 is the voltage difference across Rg. The current through it is V1 minus V2 by Rg. And notice as I've drawn these arrows here, these are the currents through R1 above, above and R1 below. These two currents have to be the same as V1 minus V2 by Rg. For the simple reason that once the current enters into this node, say, it has nowhere else to go. It can't go into the op amp, as I said, op amps draw tiny amount of current. So whatever current flows here is the same as the current which is flowing through Rg. Same goes for this one. So using that, you can easily figure out what the voltages are here and here. And these are the voltages V plus and V minus which we have been fed into our our differential amplifier circuit. So let's see, figure out what those voltages are. Well, all we need to figure out is I know this current V1 minus V2 by Rg. So if you multiply that current, which is the same as the current flowing here, by R1, you get the voltage drop across this R1. You know this voltage is already V2. So voltage at the other end, which we are calling V2 star, has to be well, R1 V2 minus this voltage and you will just write that down, you will get this expression. V2 minus R1 by Rg into V1 minus V2 translates to 1 plus R1 by Rg times V2 minus R1 by Rg times V1. So that's the voltage at this point, which is our input to the differential amplifier, one of the inputs. Well, what about the other input? That's also straightforward. The voltage drop across this R1 is the same as the voltage drop across this one for the simple reason that the same current flows through this resistance and the resistors are, are both R1. But this, of course, being above the voltage V1, you have to add this drop to V1 to get the voltage here. And a very similar calculation shows that V1 star, the voltage here, turns out to be very, very similar. So now that we know the two inputs V1 star and V2 star to our differential amplifier, the output is straightforward. We have already figured out earlier that is going to be R3 by R2 times V2 star minus V1 star. And from that point on, it's a trivial amount of algebra to just show that your output in terms of the actual input to the circuit is going to be proportional to V2 minus V1. And the proportionality factor here is going to be R3 by R2 times an additional factor 1 plus 2 R1 by Rg. Now this additional factor gives you an extra gain, but it's not the extra gain which is important here. What is important is that you can tune the gain by just changing the single raised to Rg. And if you do that, that what that's going to achieve is that you're going to be able to tune the gain to whatever value you want just by turning one knob somewhere and that gives this circuit an extra advantage. So this solves both problems at once. You have a way of tuning the output gain rather precisely and your circuit draws very, very tiny amount of current from the sources. So while the differential amplifier is often good enough for our purposes when we are trying to figure out the difference between two voltages through a circuit, if you really wanted to do it professionally and precision really mattered, you would actually use the instrumentation amplifier, which just takes two more op amps and three more resistors. And of course, that's an extra cost, but it's not really a huge amount of extra cost. By the way, as I've been telling you over and over again, this usually the batteries in the circuit, or in this case, the dual power supply, the plus minus 12 volt power supply. That's usually the most expensive part of these circuits. And here it might seem like you will need three dual power supplies, one for each op amp instead of one. So that would increase the cost a huge amount. But usually it won't because most dual power supplies can actually drive enough current so that they can drive three op amps at once. So you can just use the same power supply to power all of them. Expense doesn't really grow because of that. 
this is a reasonably simple circuit which actually works to a huge degree of accuracy and is what is often used in professional circuits. By the way, let me just add one thing here. I have been talking about the op amp with the in quotes in all these videos as if there is only one kind of op amp. Well, if you just look at a standard electronics manufacturer's catalog, you will find that there are many, many different kinds of op amps and these are really good at different things. There are some very high precision op amps which deliver extremely accurate final results. Uh, there are th some op amps which work very well under different temperature conditions. There are other op amps which work very well at high frequencies, which most cheap op amps won't. So, depending on which circuit you have, you may have to choose your particular op amp. If you were actually building circuits, you would have to pay attention to what your particular op amp is good at. We have been sticking mostly to general statements and for that the IC741 which is a general purpose op amp reasonably cheap and easily available is good enough. However, the IC741 does have several deficiencies. So for high precision, high frequency, important work, you would want to go in for more specific op amps. I am not going to go into those technical details here. If you are really interested in designing a wonderfully good op amp circuit for your particular purpose, you would of course have to look at say catalogs or look up the net to find details of which op amp would suit that particular application better. The next circuit that we are going to meet is once again a circuit we have already seen before. This is an integrator based on the op amp. But as you can see from the heading, we are going to talk about the practical version for this. And just to remind you, what an integrator is supposed to do is that it's supposed to produce an output VO which is proportional to the integral of the input voltage VI from an initial time zero when we are assuming that the circuit has been started to our current time T. And this formula assumes that the capacitor that we use in this circuit is uncharged at time T equal to zero to begin with. But notice that what I am saying here is that this formula is correct provided you are using a situation without an RF. Now, if you recall your original integrative circuit, there was no RF. So, what actually is this practical circuit we are talking about? Let me remind you that this actually is very, very similar to the circuit that we had discussed in the last video. We have an input voltage, a resistance through which the input uh, voltage is fed. Now you have a capacitor in the feedback network and you have a VO. What we did not have earlier what was this RF. So let me quickly remind you how this worked by ignoring for the time being the RF. Since this is at 0 volts, this will be at virtual 0 volts. So the current here will be VI by R which of course will depend on time if the input voltage depends on time. This current in the absence of RF would feed entirely through the capacitor and that would lead to a, the capacitor charging up. And the ch amount of charge which the capacitor will accumulate will of course depend on the integral of the current, integral of Vi by R. And you, if you divide that by C, you get the voltage drop across the capacitor. And since this is an end is at 0 volts, the output is going to be minus that voltage drop. And that is what gives rise to this formula. Of course, all this ignores the RF which we have co co connected to the circuit. But apparently, the circuit is working fine without an RF. Why mess it up by connecting an additional feedback resistor? The answer to that lies in the fact that if you are actually trying to design a circuit like this, something which really gives you a response like this, then if your input signal had a DC part, a constant part, that would lead to trouble. Why? Because if you have a constant input voltage, then this time integral will keep on accumulating over time. And as a result, this circuit will soon go to very large negative or positive values. Negative assuming Vi is a, has a constant positive part, but positive if Vi had a constant negative part. 
either way it's go the vo is going to increase smoothly with time and as a result you are going to end up with saturation so your circuit will not really work as an integrator any longer because it's going to go and hit saturation now you might say okay fine but that's if my input has a constant part what if my input input doesn't have that what is what if it's a bunch of sinusoids well if that were the case then the integrator would would work fine even without the rf the problem is most signal sources that you will have will have some dc offset something which may be very tiny a, tip, a dc offset may be an error may be produced by some kind of mismatch in the circuit but ultimately you are going to end up with a very tiny value and why bother about a tiny value well note that the tiny value will not stay tiny here even a very very tiny dc offset as is going to end up giving a huge value as you allow enough time so let me just put this in context suppose you have a millivolt order dc offset value some constant dc so what was on top of whatever signal you have which is very very tiny let's say a millivolt now that will take 10000 rcs 10000 time constants to grow to a size of 10 volts and if your circuit have an rc of a kilo ohm and a c of say a microfarad which is very common your time constant for the circuit will be around a millisecond So ten thousand time constants may sound like a huge amount, but that's only ten seconds. So ten seconds after you switch on your circuit, it's going to go into saturation, and in most cases it will happen even faster. So this is the problem which this circuit has. Not this circuit, the original integrator circuit without the RF. So without RF, even a tiny DC part of the signal will drive the output to saturation. It will take some time, but the time is typically very small. So, how do you prevent that from happening? You prevent that from happening by adding this feedback resistor. Now, how does this work? The answer is actually simple. Note that it is the DC part or the low frequency part that we are worried about. It's the DC which keeps on accumulating. Now, for DC, of course, the capacitor essentially behaves like an open circuit, which means that as far as very low frequencies are concerned you can imagine that the capacitor is not there in the circuit the circuit is consists only of r and rf what that means is that you are going to end up with a amplifier standard inverting amplifier which is going to produce an amplified version of whatever signal you have so the dc voltage is just going to be amplified now since the dc offset is expected to be tiny anyway amplifying it will not be a huge bother if you amplify it even by a factor of say 10 or 20 it's still going to be a few millivolts much much smaller than the other voltages in the circuit so we can safely ignore that however it's obvious that the presence of the rf is going to sort of mess up the integrating action on the signal that you really want to integrate but there comes in this wonderful fact that the capacitance has an impedance which depends on the frequency once the frequency is large enough c has a very tiny impedance remember the impedance of a capacitor goes down with frequency is 1 by omega c in magnitude what that means is for reasonably large frequencies the capacitor is going to behave like a short is going to short out rf so at large frequencies the effect of rf is not going to be visible so so how big an rf would you choose that actually depends on the kind of frequency range you want to use your circuit in as long as this thing the j 1 by j omega c the the impedance or this really is a reactance With the capacitor, because I am taking the magnitude here, is much much less than RF. The circuit will behave perfectly well like an integrator. It will behave as if the RF is not there. So as long as you have done this, as long as your frequency range for your signal is much much bigger than one by two pi 
see r and the 2 pi really comes in just from the connection between omega and l so this is the condition you really want so as long as the frequency is much much bigger than 1 by 2 by c r f this will behave like an integrator so when you are designing a circuit you would need to know what kind of frequency ranges you are going to use the integrator for and ensure that your frequency range is much much bigger than this quantity which you can easily ensure by just choosing rf properly of course there is a balance here you can make this cut off frequency the frequency below which your circuit is not really going to work very well like an integrator you can make this pretty small by making rf huge but if you make rf huge the gain of the inverting amplifier for dc becomes very large that's not what you want because remember your dc offset is not what something you want to really amplify by a huge amount so there's a bit of balancing act to be played out but it's usually pretty easy to find a range of rf for which your circuit will work wonderfully well as an integrator for the frequencies which you really want to integrate and will not work as an integrator at all or rather but rather like a reasonable gain amplifier for dc and so the dc output will not get a chance to saturate the op amp so this is how you make the integrator into a practical circuit when you make immense use of an integrator in the next circuit however when i draw the integrator there i will drop the rf just because it's sort of gets clumsy if you keep on drawing in the rf all the time but you have to remember when you're really using an integrator in your circuit you have to put in a feedback resistor to prevent saturation by the dc offset values so now that we have learned how to make our integrator into a practical circuit which will not be swamped by accumulation of dc offset over time let us try to use it in doing something rather amazing we are going to use an op amp based circuit to solve a differential equation remember that's exactly what op amps really are for they are for doing mathematical operations and calculations now you might say i can solve differential equations easily enough on a digital computer so why bother with an op amp based circuit the answer to that is speed digital computers are of course fine they can do many many things they are very versatile and as a result of that they have to be designed in such a way that they can do many many things which essentially makes them a bit slow now you might say that's absurd modern digital computers are very very rapid that's true however depending on some applications depending on how fast you want a response to some input stimulus even a digital computer may be too slow and that's where the analog computation comes in so if you are guiding a say a ballistic missile towards a target or you are controlling a nuclear reactor you really don't want your response time to be larger than it has to be so for those very specific calculations where versatility is not important you don't have to solve a lot of things or a lot of different things you just have to solve one equation but do it really really fast analog computers along the designs that we are talking about but not ex well they can be much more complicated than the ones i'm talking about i'm going to give you a simple example analog computers along these lines are still the method of choice so how does a drone really work or really control itself there are on board digital computers but some really critical time sensitive things are usually still done using analog circuits so let's try to see that but we are going to of course not handle very complicated equations here i just want to give you a flavor of how this is done so what i'm going to do next is to show you how to solve a very very simple differential equation one which you can easily solve by hand namely this one of course as i've said it's not my aim to show you how to solve a complicated differential equation here this is more an indicator of how to do the thing you can of course make uh well uh, make up your own circuits to solve more and more complicated differential equations based on these principles so first step that we will take 
solve this differential equation or rather rewrite this differential equation so that uh, we can express the highest derivative which in this case of course is g2x g2 in terms of the rest. So what we do is we rewrite this in this fashion. So we solve for the highest derivative and this is what we get. d2x d2 is 6 dx dt plus 2x plus 5 sin omega t. Now how does this help us? Our next step would be just imagine somehow that we have d2x d2 available for with us. How exactly we arrive at d2x d2 is not really an important point right now. Let's just imagine that we have a voltage which gives you d2x d2. So what we will do next is we will send that to two integrators one after the other. Now I am not indicating the precise RC values to be used. I am not also putting in the RF, the feedback register that you need to put in to make this into a practical integrator. As I said, this is just a schematic. But you can fill in the details and figure out exactly what component values to use from the equations that we have derived earlier. All I am saying is, if you pass d2 x d2 through an integrator, you are going to get minus dx dt. If you pass that through another integrator, you are going to get x. Now, this might seem like a bit of a strange thing. After all, we do not have d2x d2 to begin with. So, this looks like something like building a castle in the air. But let us persist with this anyway and let's see what we can do with this. The next step would be to try to combine the derivative minus dx dt and x to form part of the right hand side, in particular, to try to form this particular portion. So how do we do that? This looks like a sum but remember to what we have are x and minus dx dt. So what we really need is a difference. So what we can do is send these two voltages through a differential amplifier with properly chosen resistance ratios and what we can get out of this is minus 6 dx dt minus 2x. Of course, for this, you have to choose the resistance ratios properly. And this again is a task which I leave you to worry about. We have already told you how to do that. Just as a reminder, this is the differential equation that we had. And two of the terms on the right have been built up here. All you need to do is throw in a 5 sin omega t. So if you have a minus 5 sin omega t source from somewhere, which is a standard sinusoidal source, you may say that okay I may have a sinusoidal source but I don't have 5 sin omega t uh, I may have some other factor I may not have a minus 5 sin omega t but all that can be easily handled by putting your sinusoidal source to an appropriate amplifier so I'm omitting that part let's just assume I do have a minus 5 sin omega t available now the output here is minus 6 dx dt minus 2x so take your minus 5 sin omega t and send this and minus 5 sin omega t through an adder which is this circuit here you are going to build up the right hand side of your differential equation 6 dx dt plus 2x plus 5 sin omega t so this is all great if you had g2 x g2 to begin with and then integrations would have given you the two derivatives and the differential amplifier here gives you one part of your right hand side, passes through a, this to an adder with an external sinusoidal source. You have got your right hand side completely. However, the original problem still persists. How do I get uh, D2X D2 to begin with? All this depends on having D2X D2 to start with. And the answer to that is simple. Our differential equation really is the d2x d2 is equal to this and the easiest way of achieving two voltages being equal is just join them with a short. And this is what completes the circuit. Once you have this, this circuit has no option but to obey d2x d2 is equal to 6 dx dt plus 2x plus 5 sin omega t. So if you build this circuit, connect the power, op and power supplies and then switch it on it's automatically going to solve the differential equation for you. In fact, 
you may want to put in initial conditions and initial values of minus dx dt and x but that's easily achieved by putting in uh, extra charges on the capacitors to begin with so you can charge your capacitors to the requisite voltages before you start your circuit once you do that that takes care of the initial conditions and finally how do you get x well all you have to do is measure the voltage at this point and you will get the time dependence of x of t a solution to our differential equation d2 x d2 equals 6 dx dt plus 2 x plus 5 sin omega t of course, as you can well imagine, but because we have multiplying circuits, we have exponentiators, we have logarithmic amplifiers, we have adders, subtractors, and so on. So all kinds of complicated terms, nonlinear effects or whatever, what you will, can be built in into an analog circuit like this. And ultimately, of course, why stop at a second order differential equation? You can put in higher orders just by putting in more integrators. So very, very complicated differential equations can be solved using op-amp circuits. And they can be solved in very little time. The amount of time it just takes for the electrons to flow. And that's it. That's all you will ever need. Uh, of course, as I said, a different uh, digital, digital computer may be able to do a lot more stuff, but typically it will fall far short in terms of speed compared to an analog computer like this when you have to solve one specific differential equation over and over again. So despite the huge strides which digital computer technology has made over the last few years, we still have a huge set of applications for this kind of analog computation, especially where real-time applications are concerned. The final circuit that we will discuss in this video is called the Antonio gyrator. Now what exactly is a gyrator? That is a long story and we are not going to describe the gyrator in its full glory in this particular video. Let me just uh, tell you that the gyrator was conceived as a fifth standard circuit component, a linear circuit component, one beyond the standard ones that you all know about, the resistor, the capacitor, the inductor, and the ideal transformer. The gyrator was conceived as a fifth version which would complete the entire story. The reason why it's not so well known is that it's a bit more complicated than the other ones and also uh, there's no simple circuit element which implements the gyrator on its own. Most gyrator implementations involve active circuit components like the op-amp and so on. Now the Antonio gyrator is a very specific circuit and we are not going to discuss the details of gyrator theory here. We are just going to focus on this one particular circuit which turns out to be, have quite amazing properties. So what exactly is this circuit? The circuit actually involves five uh, impedances Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4 and Z5. These are just five impedances. As of now they can have they can be anything. They could be resistors, all of them. They could be mix of resistors and inductors or capacitors or whatever. One of the big uses of this uh, particular circuit involves one which has four resistors and one capacitor. And we will see why. But for the timing, let's keep this perfectly general. You have five impedances of whatever kind. And two op-amps, each assumed to work in the linear regions which are connected like this. So the inverting inputs of the two op amps are joined together and the non-inverting inputs are at these two ends but the output is also fed back here. Now this looks like quite a complicated circuit but uh, let me just try to show you that you can analyze the behavior of this circuit rather simply. So let's make a beginning. If this voltage is Vi and remember we are assuming that the op amp is working in the linear region which means the non-inverting input is at Vi and hence the inverting input would also be at Vi. So this voltage would be Vi. But then if we look at this op-amp and use the principle of virtual ground for it, you will find that this point is also at Vi. So this is a starting point for our discussion of the gyrator. Now, 
now that we know so many voltages, let's proceed. How much will the current here be? Now that's straightforward. That's going to be Vi by Z5. Ohm flow. But then using the fact that the current uh, through the taken by the op amp is going to be negligible, the current through Z4 is also going to be Vi by Z5. So potential drop across the two ends of Z4 is pretty straightforward. You can easily see that according to this convention, you will have a potential drop which is given by Z4 Vi by Z5. So it will be the current times the impedance. Again, Ohm's law once again. But now notice that if you take consider Z3, the two ends of Z3 have the same potential difference. It's just in this direction here, the same potential difference as across Z4 simply because the two ends of both Z3 and Z4 are at the same potential Vi. So as a result, you can easily figure out the potential drop across Z3 to be the same as this one. So what about the current through Z3? The current through Z3 will be in this direction and the current will simply be Z4 by Z5 Vi which is the potential drop across Z3 divided by Z3. So that's the current which is flowing through Z3. But that also has to be the same as the current which is flowing through Z2. Again, no current can go into the op amp. So now that we know that, how much is the potential drop across the two ends of Z2? That's pretty straightforward. It's going to be this current times the impedance, which is Z2, Z4 by Z3, Z5 Vi. So as you can see, all we have used to, throughout is just Ohm's law and the fact that the op amp maintains a VD of zero in the linear region and draws no current. Okay, fine. So what we have is a potential drop here. But that means that the potential drop across Z1 has to be exactly the same in the opposite direction. Remember, like Z2, Z1 has one end at Vi at the other end is at whatever potential this end is. So the potential drop across Zi also has to be exactly the same Z2, Z4 by Z3, Z5 Vi. So now let us ask the question, how much is the current which is flowing into the circuit from the input? What we really want is this current here, but that exactly is the same as the current flowing in through Z1 because once again no current goes into the op amp. So current going in here is simply given by the potential drop Z2, Z4 vi by z3 z5 divide that by the impedance z1 so what do we have we have a circuit to which we are feeding in the voltage vi and the current which is going into the circuit is simply given by this which means if you look at the effective impedance which this circuit provides this z is simply going to be the voltage vi divided by this current so it's going to be Z1, Z3, Z5 divided by Z2, Z4. So what we have here is that this circuit provides an impedance to an external source to which you are connecting VI, connecting, which you are connecting to this point. And this impedance is some combination 
of the five impedances that are there in the circuit. So what's so special about this you ask? Let me just show you one wonderful application for this. Let's just take one special case where we have chosen Z1 to be a resistance, Z2 also to be a resistance. In fact, we are choosing Z1, Z2, Z3 and Z5 to be four resistors R1, R2, R3 and R5 and we are going to choose Z4 to be a capacitance. So the impedance of Z4 is going to be 1 by J omega C. So we have four resistors and a capacitor. But what is Z going to be as a result of this? We just plug this in here. You will get R1, R3, R5 by R2 into 1 by J omega C. So what is critically important is that what we are getting is an impedance which first of all has a positive phase, a plus j instead of minus j as for a capacitance, is proportional to omega. So it's an impedance which grows with frequency and it should be obvious what circuit component has this behavior. It's an inductance. So L, the effective impedance of the circuit, the effective inductance which the circuit behaves like is R1, R3, R5, by R2 C. So what's so great about this circuit? Well, it allows you to implement an inductor in a circuit using only resistors and capacitors. And inductors are pretty, pretty difficult things to implement in a micro electronic circuit, a circuit which is small. Why? Because to get a substantial in inductance, what you need is a coil which has many turns you need a iron core, makes, all this makes it bulky and expensive. And something which is completely unsuitable for miniaturization. If you want to build a miniature circuit which has an inductance, you simply can't. The inductance is too bulky. However, this circuit gives you a way of producing an impedance which has exactly the same behavior as an inductance, simply out of capacitors and resistors, things which are much better, uh, much smaller and much more suited for miniature use. And notice that the value of the inductance can be controlled by using the resistances and the capacitance appropriately. Say, even if you use a tiny capacitor, let's say a microfarad order capacitor, all you really need to do is put in say, three one kilo ohms. Let's say we just use four one kilo ohms. Uh, that would mean that this ratio will be 10 to the 9 by 10 to the 6, 10 to the 6. So if you use a microfarad order capacitor, that alone is going to give you one Henry inductance, which is a huge, huge inductance. A one Henry inductance made out of physical components would be very bulky. This one, well, it's tiny and it can be miniaturized into one single chip, which behaves like an inductor. So very often when we need inductances in a miniaturized circuit, we use the antenna gyrator or something similar to that. Well, this is not the only possible use that the gyrator can have. For example, you could actually use two capacitors. So Z2, Z4, both could be capacitors, in which case the two J omegas that you get will give you a negative resistance. So a circuit in which if you give a voltage, the current is going to be exactly out of phase to it. And negative resistances are Many, many uses. Of course, you might say negative resistance sounds crazy because it's making current flow opposite to the voltage difference, which means it's apparently uh, violating conservation of energy. But remember, the op-amp does it by, by converting the power supply. So it's not really producing energy on its own. It's just converting the power supply to produce something like this. There are many delightful circuits which you can make by using the gyrator as one piece of the or one component for this. You can build many wonderful circuits just by using op amps in some clever combinations. In this lecture I've given you a few examples of that. This by no means exhausts the possibilities for op amps and I will at least uh, 
even to scratch the surface i would like to give at least one more lecture on this which uh, which will still not get us anywhere close to all possible op amp applications but will give you a sort of nice overview so that you can later on figure out other circuits which you can then work on on your own